Hello and welcome to Diplomata. I'm Francis Suni. The fight for Timor-Leste's independence involved a lot of people from both inside and outside the country. They came from all sorts of backgrounds, groups, history, professions, and they contributed to that whole process in their own way. One of them was Ana Gomez, the renowned Portuguese diplomat who played an important role both in the process leading up to our independence and in the re-establishment of diplomatic relations between Portugal and Indonesia from 1999 to 2003. In this episode, I'll be talking to her about her experience and involvement in diplomacy, particularly in relation to Timor-Leste. Dr. Anna, it's a great pleasure to have you on the program. Great pleasure for me, too. To start off the, the, the conversation, let us, would you mind sharing with us your history, your background, what brought you to diplomacy, what brought you to politics, and probably a little bit on your, your education as well, back in Portugal. Well, I, I was born under the Salazar dictatorship. And my family, my father was a captain of the merchant marine, was eager to see democracy, to live in democracy. So he may, uh, he and my mother have instilled in us. Uh, we didn't like to live in dictatorship. So very young, at the age of 13, 14, I started to to want to join other people would uh, overthrow the dictatorship. And it became even more clear and more conscious when I went to university. Um, and uh, of course, there was a colonial war going on by Portugal in Angola, Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau in particular. Um, so it was very uh, important for us Portuguese who wanted democracy to also understand we had to uh, to end with the colonial war. And my link with the uh, East Timor goes back to this anti-colonial past. Uh, and also the fact that actually some of the, the East Timorese leaders at that time uh, had uh, similar tendencies on the left and on the basis of this anti-colonial agenda. So that's my upbringing. Uh, I still have in my place uh, a record that was edited in uh, uh, 75 by my then party, MRPP, uh, with East Timorese songs. Uh, and this was linked to the, the, was linked to the links of uh, then uh, Fretilin leader, uh, um, Dr. Abilia Rawuju with my party. That's why my party at that time edited this record that I still have uh, with these Timuri songs. Um, then I became a diplomat. After I graduated from university, I became a diplomat. I joined the Foreign Service. And uh, uh, of course, it was quite uh, challenging for. Uh, a young Portuguese diplomat to to sell to the world the new Portugal, the democratic Portugal, the Portugal who had decolonized. But at the same time, exactly, because I knew about this Timor, I knew that Timor-Leste was unfinished business of the colonial war for Portugal. And I had the, the privilege to work with President Janes our first democratically elected president. And President Yanez was always, always very um, keen to affirm the right uh, to self-determination of the people of Timor-Leste. So uh, working with President Yanez as a young diplomatic advisor, I was very much in touch with uh, our former prime minister, Maria Luch Pintasilgu, who was at that time put in charge of Timor-Leste, the, 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 the political diplomatic process uh, at the UN. Uh, and uh, uh, that's how I got in touch with uh, Dr. Ramos Horta, who was coming to Portugal to lobby the Portuguese authorities to. And this was a time when 
not many people in Portugal knew about Timor-Leste and knew it was indeed unfinished business and uh, we could not uh, indeed close the chapter of the, our colonial responsibilities until we would uh, indeed help the people of East Timor, uh, of Timor-Leste to, to, to come to self-determination. And um, it was tough times, I must say, working as a young diplomat, then I, I went to Geneva. This was the time of the massacre of Santa Cruz. We, we know that the massacre of Santa Cruz um, happened when there was a UN rapporteur, the Professor Commons was the UN rapporteur for torture, was here, and he came here because of our work in Geneva, Ambassador Costa Lobo and myself and others. Uh, it was at the time when the Simurese were expecting the Portuguese parliamentary mission that was supposed to come, but then didn't come for reasons that I will not explain now. But then the people uh, diverted somehow the demonstrations towards this UN representative, uh, who was the UN representative, uh, UN rapporteur against torture. Uh, then the killing of Sebastian Gomes occurred, then the demonstration, uh, which was witnessed by this Professor Coimans, and then, of course, the massacre of Santa Cruz. And I think the massacre of Santa Cruz was really what changed the perceptions of, of the Portuguese people and of the world about Timor-Leste. I know that the Portuguese people, people who didn't know anything, who had forgotten about Timor-Leste, uh, when they saw the images made by Max Tal and they saw the, the statements being made by these two American journalists, Amy Goodman and uh, Alan Nain, about Timor Leste, when the Portuguese saw the images of the people in the, in the, the Cemeterio de Santa Cruz praying in Portuguese, it was a very powerful punch in the stomach, in the heart. And then the Portuguese public opinion changed and and started demanding from political leaders in Portugal that they would stand up for Timor-Leste. And so, in a way, uh, it became easier for diplomats like me to do our job, which has always been to indeed claim attention and, uh, and lobby for East Timor. Ah, oh, well, uh, then of course I can tell you that I was, after Geneva, I was I was involved in the first resolution we got in Geneva in 93, because of Santa Cruz. Uh, I worked on that. I, I worked in London when Shanana was arrested and then Shanana went to trial and uh, we got, thanks to Tamrat Samuel, the um, written notes of Shanana in his trial, in his defense, and I remember um, receiving a phone call from Kama Bujardo, who was a great, campaigner for the political prisoners in Indonesia, but also for Solidarity in Timor-Leste, who asked me to come and help her translate from the handwritten notes of Shanana in Portuguese into English, so that next day the Guardian would publish that, which happened. I mean, I translated for Kamel in the photocopies where we had the handwritten notes by Shanana. And of course, I came uh, then in the Portugal, uh, we created a special office to deal with Timor, uh, which was called the Gabinete de Estudo, the Assuntos Políticos Especiais. It was actually Gabinete Timor Leste, headed by my dear colleague, Ambassador uh, Rui Quartin Santos, who was then our first ambassador here later in Timor Leste. And we knew, we understood, uh, I think. Of course, we helped uh, Dr. Ramos Ort and campaign for the Nobel Award. We helped um, uh, help uh, the efforts of the Timor East Timorese to create Solid Amor in Indonesia. They were very brave Indonesians. I will never forget uh, Rosa Yanida Mayanti, who came to Portugal in the days of Soharto. She was so brave for a meeting of solidarity with Timor-Leste. So we understood that when Soharto would fall, would fall or, or, or die, this could be the window of opportunity 
for a solution for Timor-Leste. And that's what happened in 97, when uh, 98, Soharto fell in 98, May 98. I was in New York. Uh, then our two ministers, um, Alatas and uh, Jamagama, met on the 5th of August uh, 98. Of course, in the meantime, there had been the offices of the Secretary General with the so-called AETD, the Intertremories uh, uh, All-Inclusive Dialogue. Um, but that led nowhere, but was nevertheless an interesting exercise. So when Suharto fell, we understood this was the window of opportunity. And on the 5th of August, 98, after the two ministers agreed, because we understood we need to open the intersection. It's, it's important to be in Indonesia, understand the evolution in Indonesia, and to be talking to Indonesians who want to find a solution like it was the case of uh, the minister Ali Alatas. Um, that's the day, 5th of August, uh, 98, that the minister, uh, Jaim Gama, told me, well, in a couple of months, how do you think you're going to be feeling in Indonesia? Because he immediately thought of me to be having that mission in Indonesia. And indeed, on the 30th of August, uh, no, 30th of January, 99, I arrived in Jakarta. The day we had agreed in the meantime that we would uh, open the intersections of Portugal in, in Jakarta and Indonesia in Portugal. And, um, of course, Three days earlier, you had the Abibi Declaration that changed a lot. And we immediately understood that from then on, of course, discussing autonomy was just the, the pretext. The important thing was actually to enable this referendum with international supervision. And that's why we started immediately working. And my job was to, of course, be in touch with uh, Shanana and uh, was still in Chipinang prison and in, with other uh, Timorese leaders from the in interior. We were in touch with, of course, Dr. Ramos Orta, with Maria Katiri, Dr. Roque Rodriguez, all the representatives in the diaspora. But it was important for us to have also internal, direct contact with uh, Timorese leaders from inside. Uh, and that was my, my job. I was very fortunate uh, to leave that period. 99, uh, my first visit to Timor Leste was on the 11th of March 99, still under Indonesian occupation. I remember I went to see the chief of the police, uh, Colonel Timbul Silayan. I went to see uh, Commander Tono Suratman of the military, who had an angel face but was a, a bastard. Um, I don't know if you can say that in television, but I say it. Uh, because there were, Timbal Silai one was a decent person, I, I later found out. And then I came in May, uh, after uh, terrible things that already occurred, like the massacre of Likisa in April, the massacre at the house of uh, Sr. Benoit Carrascalão uh, in May, uh, these were very tough moments for everybody, but as well for me in Jakarta because I was in touch with the people here and I knew they, what they were enduring. Uh, later I came, uh, I was here the day UNAMET was uh, open, 1st of June. I was so pleased that Ian Martin, whom I knew was the head of that mission, I knew it, UNAMET was in good hands. Kamrat Samuel and Francis Wendell, who had played a crucial role in the UN, had worked out to make sure that indeed it was someone absolutely reliable like uh, Ian Martin. So I was very much in touch with them. And I followed the whole process. And I must say the relationship with, uh, of course, uh, uh, Mombot Chanana was crucial. To get the in, in, inside uh, perception uh, and to uh, make us make the decision to go for that agreement, despite the fact that we knew that there was a big risk um, with the security being still in the hands of the Indonesian military. 
but it was a risk that was worth taking. And we would never, we, Portugal, would never be able to, do, to take that risk without uh, knowing, being sure that the Eastern Marines leaders were also taking that risk. And I think they were very um, strategic, very knowledgeable about the evolution in Indonesia, the window of opportunity that existed. And so I was, um, I feel very privileged to have lived all that. And in that process, of course, I met a lot of uh, personalities here in Timor Leste, uh, with whom I'm still friends to this day, uh, and with whom I enjoy always speaking. And after that, uh, well, I can tell you of a lot of stories. The, my involvement uh, with the help of João Camara and uh, Mambo Chanana to make as many people return to East Timor from those that had been brought by the militia to Timor Barat. And, uh, you know, all these years I've been back. And uh, I've been back namely for the elections as a European parliamentarian following your uh, democratic elections. So I've been very fortunate of my involvement with Timor Leste. Your period in, in, in Jakarta, 1999-2003, Indonesia must have known, have known that you were very active in the independence movement, uh, the movement for independence of Timor Leste. How tough was it for you uh, to work with um, Indonesia at the time? You know, I never felt uh, strong and uh, hostile feelings from the Indonesian people. I knew that some military didn't like me, and I also didn't like them. But I know also even in the military there were also decent people, and I'm still friends, for instance, with Pa SBE and Pa Luhut Panjatan and other military who were clever, who understood that this was a problem that Indonesia had to put an end to it. And uh, other people like Pali Alatas and Pa Sanvirayuda and other diplomats from Indonesia, they wanted as well to solve the problem. They knew me, but they knew that, as I always said, we have nothing, we Portugal have nothing against Indonesia. What, all what we are doing is for East Timor, is for Timor Leste. It's not against Indonesia. We want to solve that problem. Uh, for the people of Timor Leste, but this is not necessarily against the people of Indonesia. We have nothing against Indonesia. We want Indonesia strong and in peace, and without this big problem, which Palatas in his book calls the pebble in the shoe, but it was a real pebble in the shoe for them. And I think that was probably. Um, well, you know, the fact that I had lived our own revolution in 74, the Carnation Revolution, Revolução do 25 de Abril, probably also prepared me for the privilege of living the Indonesian revolution after Suharto. And I understood immediately there were bad guys, but there were lots of good guys. People who were Indonesian friends of Timor Leste who had been very solidar with the, with the prisoners, uh, journalists, and I immediately established relations with lots of great people who are till this day my friends that I come to Jakarta. Every time that I come to Timor Leste, I come to Jakarta to see these good old, good friends from Indonesia who were really important and who wanted as well Indonesia to settle the question of, of Timor Leste because they understood this was very bad for Indonesia, for the reputation, international reputation of Indonesia, for the suffering caused here. And they knew that uh, Timor Leste could, could be independent and much uh, with a better, with a very good relation with Indonesia, as the last 20 years have demonstrated. So um, I never felt uh, you know, I, I, I was in Indonesia without any security. We didn't, I didn't have any security, except the security that the Indonesians wanted to give me. And it was very clear, my security is what you provide to me. So if something happens to me or, or, or our team, it's your responsibility. 
uh, that's what I uh, went to tell them uh, when, uh, right after the Likisa massacre. I went to tell the military, the top commanders. I asked a meeting with General Viranto, who was the commander in chief. I didn't meet him, but met his number two and 10 generals. And I said to them, if you think that by, well, what happened in Likisa, in that horrendous massacre at the church, it's your responsibility. Either you are criminal or incompetent. And if you do this or allow this to sort of uh, create from us a reaction and get out of the negotiating table, as it had occurred in the past, it won't work. We really negotiating with your politicians to find a solution. So don't do more things like that. So I think even some military were, of course, the ones uh, gaining uh, uh, training ground and uh, uh, business here in Timor Leste, understood that this the history was uh, was going to change, and uh, started doing, uh, you know, some persuasion that would allow what 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 occur. I know that the military were not happy with the process that was. Uh, that led to the signature of the 5th May Agreement in New York, which opened the way for the referendum. But some military played a very important role to, to make it happen. Your role, one of the very important roles you had as well in that period was to re-establish the diplomatic relations between Indonesia and Portugal that had not worked very well uh, previously. What was your, your biggest challenge in, in your capacity as the Portuguese diplomat uh, having to do that, to take that task? Well, I, I, again, I was very lucky. <laughs> and Portugal was very lucky. It must be said that we had a good relation with Indonesia in the colonial days, because don't forget, when Timor-Leste was Portuguese, a Portuguese colony, we had a border with Indonesia. Indonesia was our neighbor. And that's why we had the visit of Pa Sukarno, official visit of Pa Sukarno to Portugal in 59. We were neighbors, Portugal and Indonesia. And you know very well, the Portuguese cultural heritage in Indonesia is very significant, it's very treasured by Indonesians. You go to Flores, you go to Larantuka, they still have the Semana Santa there every year. And you know, the language, uh, everything. And so I know that there were many Indonesians who had a, uh, who valued the relations with Portugal because of the past and who wanted to solve the problem of Timor-Leste. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, I think the Indonesian politicians, and I must pay tribute to Paalatas in particular, because he was the one who steered the negotiating process towards the completion of the uh, 5th of, eight, uh, of, uh, of May agreement and with uh, the Consulta Popular being organized, uh, they wanted to solve the problem. They knew that the military were not in favor, but they still moved in that direction. After the destruction that happened here and all that, uh, I think Portugal was wise. On one hand, we campaigned uh, dramatically to have an international presence of internet, Interfet here. But we, did, we were clever not to demand to participate in that force. We were not part of Interfet. And it was actually not to pour more salt in the wound of Indonesia, to help them, you know, overcome and heal. Uh, I, uh, I was moving in Jakarta to, of course, press for a speedy uh, decision by the MPR to annul the annexation after the, the voting here on the 30th of August. And uh, uh, that occurred uh, in October 99. And I had uh, 
uh, sent a cable to Lisbon saying, I mean, we were the ones who severed the relations with Indonesia back in 75 as a reaction towards the invasion. We should be the ones demanding to resume relations, diplomatic relations with Indonesia once the parliament of Indonesia decides to cancel the annex. And how was the reaction of the government in Portugal? It was positive. I got in, I asked for these instructions and I got instructions that the day after, I knew a few days in advance because I was very much in touch. At that time it was minister, it was already Guzur, the president, and it was um, minister Awishihab who also played a very important role as foreign affairs minister. And uh, Awishihab had told me that probably it would be that day in October that NPR would, uh, would take the decision. So uh, at, at that time I had already instructions from Lisbon. Okay, the next day after the cancellation of the annexation, you send a verbal note asking for the resumption of diplomatic ties with Indonesia. And I did it the next day. I had suggested that to Lisbon. Lisbon had agreed, they had given me the instructions to do that, and I did it. And then there was a very important factor which led to the reply of Indonesia so that on the 28th of December 99, so less than one year after I arrived in Jakarta, we were officially resuming diplomatic ties with Indonesia on the 28th of December 99. What was that factor? The fact that Portugal was going to take the presidency of the European Union on the 1st of January 2000. And of course I had made that point not just to Pa Awishihab, to many Indonesian diplomats, also Indonesian friends in Parliament, DPR, MPR. In the military, I had already managed to create some good relations with some clever military, and I told them, well, you know, on the 1st of January 2000, we're going to take the presidency of the European Union. Indonesia would not like to have, to not have diplomatic relations with a country that takes up this, I think this helped focus their minds. The fact is that on the 28th of December, Pali Shiab called me and said, you're gonna get the note in reply. And so on the 1st of January, 2000, we opened the embassy. I became chargé d'affaires at interim and became the president of the European ambassadors in Jakarta. And in a couple of months later, after the agreement and all that, I became Portuguese ambassador to Indonesia. And of course, uh, and I, and I, I, I delivered my credentials to um, President uh, Guzur, who was always a friend. I think he, was, he really also played a very important role. And, um, uh, and, and of course, what was then my strategy? Uh, how to rebuild ties with Indonesia. Because of course, as I said, there were many friends, many people with good memory of the diplomatic relations with Portugal, with historical ties with Portugal. But there were as well the, all these people, you know, Eurico Guterres, or many of the violent pro-integrationists who, who had formed this PBI. I mean, they, you know, I remember very well when they attacked and killed three uh, UN, UNHCR officers in Atambua in, uh, in, uh, in September 2000, when Guzdur was delivering a speech at the General Assembly in New York. Uh, they were doing that in, that in Atambua, these horrendous killings. So I knew there was a group who was very angry and against, and I thought that the best way to indeed um, overcome and heal this uh, uh, sour past because of the, the, the problem of East Timor was to invest in cultural relations. Because the cultural relations, the cultural heritage of Portugal and Indonesia was really important. And so I, I organized exhibitions. One of the exhibitions was actually a fantastic exhibition when Ibu Mega was already president on the visit of Paso Carno to Portugal. You know, based in the, the documents that we had and the photographs in the archives of the Portuguese foreign ministry. Very cheap, cost me $15,000 to organize that exhibition, I tell you, it's ridiculous. <laughs> 
Uh, and, uh, you know, by uh, then we did a, already, also we did Bumega, a fantastic exhibition about the Portuguese cultural heritage in Indonesia. Uh, uh, with uh, Ibu Maga came to inaugurate that exhibition uh, in the Textile Museum with the help of the Gobenkian Foundation. We started doing, for instance, I started supporting uh, the Tugu group who plays the original Kronchong. By the way, do you know that what is Kronchong? The music that came originally from Portuguese. Yes, Fado. and you know why? Because the instrument in which they play the cronchong, what they, they call the cronchong, it is a Portuguese cavaquinho. And the cronchong, if you see, it's very much like the mornas of Cabo Verde. The connection is obvious. And you know, this Tugu group that I found in the north of Jakarta, they were still singing cronchong morisco and cronchong cafrinho, which were sung sung in the Portuguese language for 500 years. Amazing. So, yeah, I started uh, helping that group, hiring them for our receptions to support them. So I invested in the cultural relations. Cultural relations was something which was valued by Indonesia. It was not controversial. Everybody liked, it was about the Indonesia's uh, cosmopolitan, approach. I mean, the Indonesians are the very cosmopolitan people and they, you know, so it, I think it was the right strategy. At the same time, I was working, namely with Pa Alata and Pa Susilo Bangbang Yudhiono and with Pa Yusuf Kala in persuading the, the East Timorese, we were in Timor Barat, to come back and articulating with uh, Pasha Nana here to make sure that the communities here were prepared because then the, the commissions on the, through certain reconciliation started working and it was a very important healing process so that the communities who stayed in Timor Leste would receive those who had gone more or less forced by the militia. We will continue the conversation after the following program. You're with us on Diplomata. Tempo passa férias. Hmm, ita viazin lai. Tempo nebe hau henghela. Tempo atu estima an. Tempo atu halo viazin furak liutan. Escolha no decide viagem Hamutu Ho Ami. LZX, Agency Tours and Travel. Hotel Vila Verde, Dili Timor Leste. Happy Holiday! Aha! Viagem Babali! Singapore! Barato no competitivo. Se halo e minha viagem facilio tan. Lorondiak ba maluk sira nebe makakarak fosai anuncio publicidade, aviso, informação, kafansa san. Rai uma careta no produto Siraceluctam, bele contacto me ame iha departamento comercial o número telefone 7705-6543, bele limos o si email honaran comercial arroba gmntv.tl. Ame si muita bo sirane pedido o si kiktobot, gmn parceiro ba sucesso.
Thank you for staying with us on Diplomata. In 2003, you decided to leave diplomacy, the diplomatic world, and move to politics. What was behind that decision? Well, uh, I thought that uh, it was really a privilege to be a Portuguese diplomat who became ambassador in Jakarta, who helped with many other people uh, from the Portuguese diplomatic and political establishment. But because of the heroic fight of East Timor, of the East Timorese, because of course Portugal was just a lawyer. We wouldn't have done anything if the Timorese would not have had that heroic resistance. Uh, it was a privilege to be one of the people working on that throughout my diplomatic career and ending as ambassador in Jakarta. And I thought, I can't get a, a better job. At that time, Prime Minister Duran Barros told me, you choose, you go anywhere, you choose. And I said, no, I can't have a better job. You know, it's... And also for political internal reasons, Portugal, I mean, I was re seeing a lot RTP in Jakarta and I was not liking what I was seeing. <laughs> I didn't like the too much dominance of football in Portuguese politics. Now it's even worse. I thought, um, I had actually planned to go and my husband was ambassador in Brazil at that time to accompany him and write a book about the process in East Timor, uh, seen from Jakarta. But that's exactly when our speaker, Ferro Rodrigues, who was just here uh, for the celebrations, asked me to join uh, him in the leadership of the party. I was a member of that party, the Socialist Party. And still I am a member of the Socialist Party. And I thought it, it was important. There were lots of young women, Portuguese young women, would write to me because they had seen me on television because of Timor Leste. And I thought, I need to encourage more women and more young women to move into politics. So I should myself uh, make that step. And that's the reason uh, why I accepted the invitation of uh, Dr. Ferro Rodrigues and uh, suspended my diplomatic career. And, and then, of course, he had the plans that I would become uh, a member of the European Parliament. I ran for the elections. I got three terms, very interesting, fulfilling job. I loved it. It was a way also to continue my campaign for Timor Leste with my European fellow parliamentarians, and I came, I had the, the privilege to come several times to Timor Leste for the different elections, also for complicated times in 2006. I came during the crisis. Uh, I think that's what friends are for <laughs> in good and bad times. Um, and so, what can I tell you? Uh, now, uh, because the work in the European Parliament is extremely heavy, demanding. I need to be closer to my family, my husband, my grandchildren. I decided now to put an end to my not run again after three mandates, 15 years, to be based in Lisbon. And finally, to find the time, this is my priority now, to write that book about the process of the solution of Istimor seen from Jakarta which I think is, I mean, it's a plan that I had since 2003, which I have postponed, and now I must do it. It's my obligation to do it. I think it's important for the history of Timor Leste, but also to the, for the history of Portugal. So I think it's my obligation to write that book. That's now my priority. Not only writing a book, I understand that you're also involved in some work on films. Films oh, yeah. that will be shot in Team Leste. Yeah. How did that come about? Well, it's an incredible story, but um, I have a, a double personal interest. Uh, and it's on one hand because I think it's important to put uh, Timor Leste in the world map. Well, of course. Timor-Leste is already in the world map, namely for the heroic 
uh, fight for liberation and the great success story that are these 20 years as we saw in the celebrations. I mean, I know that sometimes uh, Timorese can be very critical. Uh, friends like me can also be sometimes very critical, but I can see the difference and it's fantastic indeed. The, the difference that we see in Timor Leste if we compare with 20 years ago and knowing what happened. But uh, on the other hand, I think Timor Leste is not well known for its role during the Second World War, where Timor Leste was strategic to stop the then uh, axis of evil, which was the Nazi fascist. Uh, Japanese, I mean, uh, German, uh, Italian, Japanese axis. Not only because of the strategic location of Timor Leste, but also because of, again, the heroic resistance of the people of Timor Leste. 50,000, 60,000 Timorese have died at that time. And this was, I think, it has a lot to do with, you know, the resistance later may have roots as well in that resistance and also in the uh, uh, the Timorese resistance to colonial powers, to the colonial power of Portugal too. Although Portugal did not bother too much the Timorese as it bothered other peoples in Africa, but still many people resented the colonial power here. And uh, I think that is very important to tell that story. And that's why I think it's important to make that film about the role of East Timor during the uh, resistance to, uh, to the Japanese occupation. And what is the personal interest, apart from the my, my, uh, my interest as a friend of Timor Leste, it's also because the script for this film was written by my uh, ex-husband, uh, who already died, uh, father of my daughter, uh, who wrote this book about the, based on the notes of uh, uh, Tenant Peters, the diary of Tenant Peters. But that's indeed um, the history, so there is historical facts. And it's indeed a film not about Tenant Peters or, uh, or anyone else, but actually about the heroic struggle of the people of Timor Leste, uh, together with some Portuguese, together with uh, some Australians. And I think this film is going to be a great opportunity to show not just the past, put Timor Leste in the map of the Second World War, because this was the land where this axis of evil of that time was firstly defeated but also to show the Timor Leste of today because the, the beautiful landscape has not changed and it's going to be a great opportunity for um, touristic promotion and so on. So I, I think it's a project that is worth uh, going ahead and that, that's why I'm, I'm supporting the, the director Francisco Mans who has done a lot of films in, in, uh, in Africa and with, many Portuguese-speaking countries, uh, Brazil as well. I think it's going to be good for Timor Leste. It's, it's a film, by the way, it's a long, it's a film, but it's also a TV series. And it's mostly to be made here in Timor Leste with Timorese actors. If I may go a little bit backwards, how was your experience working with the resistance leaders of uh, Timor Leste? Uh, back before independence, uh, you mentioned the name of uh, Mangbot Shanana. And, uh, how was it working with people who were fighting for their independence? Look, um, I, as I tell you, I, I, I've met uh, Dr. Hamzorta, Dr. Rok Turig, Dr. Maria Katiri, maybe in the 80s, right, early 80s when they were diplomatic campaigning for Timor Leste. Uh, we heard about the other uh, resistant leaders, of course, uh, Nicolau Lobato, 
Connie Santana, Mahuno, Mahudo, many others. Uh, I only met personally Shanana when he was already in jail huh, in 99. He was a legend already, also for us. Taur Matan Ruat, General Taur Matan Ruat, now Prime Minister. I, I had a, a first phone call for him from him from the mountains in May 99, while I was in a, a meeting here in, uh, in Dili. So he was in the mountains, but he, the resistance was so well organized that he knew when to call that meeting, which was supposed to be clandestine, that I was having uh, with the resistance leaders. And of course, in 1999, I built very strong relationship with several resistance leaders, with David Chimenez, with whom I was uh, uh, often on the phone and meeting. Uh, Dr. Lucas da Costa, who I attended today, the the mass for his um, preceding his funeral. He, he, I worked a lot with Dr. Lucas da Costa, with La Sama, Fernando Araujo. Uh, I, uh, we worked, I worked a lot, and I had the benefit of having uh, some Timorese luck working with me. Dr. Lucas da Costa was one of them who worked with me in the embassy for some time. Before João Freitas da Câmara, that uh, uh, Mambot Chanana asked me to take him right after he left prison, even before uh, Shanana, to work with us in the embassy. He was absolutely crucial, for instance, in all my efforts to uh, make the Timorese come back from Timor Barat. Um, so interacting with all the leaders uh, of the resistance was very important. Uh, also the, the church. I must say it was very important to be in touch with church leaders like Monsignor Bello, like uh, Bishop Don Basilio, of course, I always say I'm agnostic, I don't have uh, uh, religion, but I am a devout of Don Basilio. I always say that to him. I was uh, these last two days in back house and spending these days with Don Basilio. It's always a pleasure to be with him. Um, you know, my job as a diplomat, but also as a campaigner for Timor Leste, I, I consider myself to be a bit more than a, a normal diplomat in that sense that I, that I felt always as a supporter and a campaigner for Timor Leste. And uh, so my job was to be in touch with everybody and speak to everybody, including people who were from the POE integration groups and who were provided that they were for non-violence. And even two days ago, I was very happy to Hug uh, uh, Senhor Sostin do Amaral. Uh, uh, muitas outras pessoas, many other people were pro integration, but were non violent. And with whom I had to talk. And it was my job and my pleasure to talk to them, to listen to them, their points of view. They were useful. I will highlight, in particular, uh, Mr. Mario Carrascalão. I was a very uh, good friend, and every time uh, I would go, I would come to to Dili. Uh, even after the independence, I would always go and see uh, Mr. Mario Kochaskalan. I always uh, appreciated his views, and we became friends. So. You know, my perception is, uh, of course I know, and many times people here give me the perception that sometimes problems in the political process here in, 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 uh, in Timor-Leste linked to with the, the differences about the strategies for development of the country are very much linked to personal problems, all personal problems. Having to do with personalities, their role in the war, their role in the resistance, personal problems. I hope that people will be able to overcome these personal problems and indeed um, do the bitty bot and converge in the strategy for the development of the country. I remember in 2017 when I came for the elections, many people were trying to pretend these, that there were big divergences, whether we should go for the oil or for the diversification of the economy. Probably one can't go without the other. You need to do both. But fortunately, uh, I've always countered those, namely in Portugal, who have said that Oh, Timor-Leste is not viable. Timor-Leste is not governable. And I said, no, you're wrong. Timor-Leste is absolutely viable. 
Human rights is absolutely, can be a really an example for good governance. Human rights is much easier to run than, for instance, big neighbor Indonesia, with all the diversity, the islands, the, the languages, the, the, the religions. Timor Leste is much more homogeneous, much more manageable, uh, but of course it requires that the, the, the leadership is united in the purpose of serving the people of Timor Leste. And, and that's why I hope always that personal differences or, you know, old quarrels will um, be sorted out and solved in a way that is not and guided by what serves the interests of the people of Timor Leste. You know, I, 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 this day is years and people tell me, I must say I'm a bit shocked to hear this, this that the president of Timor Leste is not able to go to visit, uh, to, the, to speak at the General Assembly in New York when the Secretary General is a Portuguese, Antonio Guterres, who played a very important role as Prime Minister of Portugal at that time of the referendum. I mean, he was absolutely crucial in persuading Clinton to accept the interfet and all that, yeah? It's a bit weird that President Lowell was not able to go to New York to speak at the General Assembly or to the crowning of, uh, uh, to the investiture of the Emperor of Japan or to the Vatican or to the investiture of Jokowi in Jakarta because the parliament doesn't allow it. I that's ridiculous. I'm sorry to say that. I mean, even in Portugal, where we have, have our differences of what we call cohabitation, co I, I've never seen uh, the parties prevent the parliament from the president from doing these trips that are, it's not Mr. Francisco Guterres Loalo, it's the president of Timor Leste. What is at stake is the institutions, be it president, prime minister, or parliament. So I hope that is kind of problems that are kind of tit for tat, you do this to me, I'll do this to you tomorrow, will be sorted out in a way that really serves the interests of the people of Timor Leste, and that means uh, the state institutions that work for the people of Timor Leste. You have left the big politics for... No, no, I didn't. In Portugal, I did not. I'm still there. I'm still a member of the Socialist Party. I'm still very present, uh, giving my opinion. Namely, I have a TV program every week where I give my commentary and uh, in many other ways. I still, I don't think that politics is exhausted in working in political parties. I intend to be now more and more active in civil society namely in uh, uh, organizations who work for transparency and anti-corruption. I think this is really important, not just for Portugal, but for the whole European Union and all over the world. So uh, I may not be a member of parliament, but I still have a lot of political opportunities and, and do, have not at all uh, retired. As the, pass into reforma. I always say I'm irreformable. <laughs> Playing with the, the word reforma in Portuguese. Any plans of going back to the diplomacy world? No, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm 65 and according uh, to our retirement age, which has changed, uh, at the next year I would be, uh, I will be reaching retirement age. So I, I could go, I should have gone back the day I left the European Parliament, back to the Foreign Ministry. But I took uh, uh, an absence of leave, uh, permission to, without, without pay, exactly because in the meantime I have this program on TV, I, I do commentary, I, I work with civil society, and I want to go on doing that. I say probably things that nobody else does, dares to say in Portugal. So I have, uh, if I would be a diplomat, of course I would have to be silent. <laughs> so that's why I decided to take this absence of leave without pay and use my, my, 
my role in society to voice what many citizens feel and are not able to express and to work with the civil society, um, you know, supporting cases that many think, people think are lost. In, in the time, long time ago, many people thought that the case of Istimor was lost. And I want, one of those who said, no, it's not, and we have to do the right thing, no matter how long it takes. Because, of course, the people of Istimor were fighting and were resisting. So I see now people, there's a young man, for instance, a whistleblower of football leagues, who now is in jail in Portugal. His name is Rui Pinto. I'm one of the people supporting him. You don't find any other politician supporting him. Maybe people don't even understand what I, why I am supporting him, but I know he's right. And sooner or later, he will be proven right, like the people of East Timor was proven right for resisting the injustice and, uh, and war and, uh, and oppression. This has been a very interesting conversation. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. And viva Timor-Leste. <laughs> Dotora Ana Gomez has shared with us a lot of stories on her involvement in the Timorese struggle for freedom. I'm sure we all have learned something from her interesting stories. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you have enjoyed the program. I'm Francis Suni, and I'll see you on the next episode of Diplomata. Bye for now.